My job is to introduce Stuart today. First thing before I forget it is I would love everyone to thank his daughter Fern here for <laughs> chauffeuring and driving him up and all the way back to Hamilton today. That's quite a commitment. <laughs> Very short story by way of introduction because as, as I feel about today at least this is a juncture of two major trails in the wilderness if not a coming of full circle and is this is this better got to get right on it I guess right on the mic so in 1928 Bob Marshall who was then working for the Forest Service came to this country and he did his legendary hike he started down by Echo Lake at the base of the Jewel Basin Road, the old Echo Lake Guard Station was there, a ranger station. And he went up and over, down the other side, there was no Hungry Horse Reservoir then. And on up to Spotted Bear, and up into that country that now bears his name as the Bob Marshall Wilderness. And then continued on further through the wilderness and over into the Mission Mountain Wilderness. And later on, in about 1935, he comes hiking up out of the Selway country, over the top of the Bitterroots, another one of his famous single day hikes. And he comes on down to the home of Guy Brandborn, Stewart's father, who was at that time the forest supervisor on the Bitterroot National Forest. And Stewart would have been about 10 years old and sat down and had dinner with the Brandborns. And as I understand it, Stuart, you still have that table in your household, is that correct? And there's an intersection that I see is, is, is just dynamite to think about that. But to think that the Bob Marshall Wilderness would not be a congressionally designated wilderness if it weren't for this guy right here and many, many others. And I'm going to cut right to the chase. Stuart saw fit to move to Washington, D.C. for many, many years to work for both the Wilderness Society, later for the National Park service, but during his time with the uh, Wilderness Society, he worked for eight long, hard years alongside Howard Zahnheiser, the initial author of that Wilderness Act, and when Howard Zahnheiser died a mere four months, unfortunately, before passage of that act, the job fell to this man here, Stuart Rander, to carry it across the goal line, and he did so. And it's my pleasure to welcome my friend and my mentor, Stuart Brandborn. I think I will raise my voice, and uh, I would encourage you standees to come closer, because I don't want anybody to take a shot at me I don't want to let that person go unidentified. <laughs> so come in a little closer if you would. It's more fun and I feel what's in my heart. I'm with my kindred spirits who love the wilderness, the wild country, and who have shared with me this appreciation of your wonderful message from our native background. And I think we have to keep that in our hearts and we have to revere the people that bring that depth of wilderness to us who evolved with it more than some of us who descend from the European branch of the human race. I uh, look at you with uh, special appreciation because you are the feet the people the folks that have held the wilderness movement together uh, you epitomize the best that we have as individuals that are committed to a grand cause that will hopefully serve and be here for the American people in perpetuity. I started uh, as a guy growing up with a mother and dad that loved nature, 
a forester that uh, had come to this country, a sweet boy from Minnesota, <clears throat> moved in to pack for his brother-in-law in Glacier Park, <clears throat> became addicted to wild country, good horses. I would throw in wild women, but I don't have that so that I can document it. But I don't underestimate the old boy. He had the good fortune to pair with my mother who had come out of a mining camp, Raidersburg. Dad had run a little general store. Uh, they both had this love for animals, for nature, and what evolved into a great commitment to wild country. I was a kid when Bob Marshall was teamed with my dad, uh, didn't know the word wilderness, it wasn't used commonly, took up wildlife because of my affinity for the creatures that we have in these mountains that we all love. and. Uh, got somehow into, well, a good pal went on a mountain goat study. <clears throat> and after one summer, he was too far ahead in his mental process to go for another summer, so he enlisted me. And uh, I went to the Red Buttes on the south end of the Chinese Wall and spent the summer of 47 and then the summer of 48 on the life history of the mountain goat. Had the good fortune to follow the goat studies into the Bitterroots, into northern Idaho, the Salmon River. And, uh, you know, goats spend a lot of time <coughs> thinking deep thoughts and looking out into space. And uh, I picked up that habit. <laughs> and it's going to be it. Not really. Uh, you wait for the goat to do something dramatic, and damn it, it takes a long time before he falls in love or decides to go down to the spring. That's a slow process. It's good for slow minds, I found. You could, you could live a good life. And uh, I rode the mountain goat with the various academic works. That led me into the game department's and the game departments led me into groups like this, people that wanted to do something for the land. And I gravitated to Washington, D.C., which was one hellish adjustment from a kid that had spent his time staring through the scope or the binox, as I said, waiting for the goats to do something dramatic. <clears throat> I became aware at that junction of the people of this country who cared deeply about what we have in our beautiful land and particularly in our wildlife. And uh, it was a stage when our country was beginning to evolve to a real appreciation and awareness that if we were going to keep these things we had to work for them, we had to fight for them. The development siege was on us. Uh, let's mine it, let's log it, let's dam it, let's develop it. We had a few agencies in the leadership. I see the green uniforms. Uh, they were out in front, Gifford Pinchel, old time advocate, uh, the leader of the United States Forest Service. With him, Bob Marshall, uh, an employee at one point, a guy who had explored the north slopes of Alaska, uh, a son of a famous, very wealthy New York icon, uh, decided that he would come forward and get this agency to recognize and sanctify this idea. And he did. Uh, he 
defined wild country, the things it gives us spiritually, the, the values it gives us in every aspect of our living, wild country, wildness. Uh, you can't beat it. It's hard to define. Each of us must define it. Uh, it's subject to different people's interpretation, but you get to the fact that when you're there, it's untrammeled by man. It's as close to as it can be to what God made it. Well, it ain't all sweet music and roses. Uh, learn that to save wilderness and the Forest Service indeed had led. The Park Service had a contingent of people who knew it, but they hadn't used the term. Marshall advanced the idea of wilderness for what it was worth in itself. Uh, he took the leadership. Uh, the Forest Service set up the wilderness system, established wilderness areas, but one guy came down the trail who realized as a relatively new servant of a little organization, a couple thousand people uh, that had been enlisted by Marshall, a uh, handful of men and women who said, this is a cause. They formed the Wilderness Society. This man was Howard Steinheiser, and he quickly recognized there were groups over here, groups there, who were fighting for this little piece of wilderness, another one there. They all were subject to different proposals for development. Uh, logging proposal here, water proposal there. There had to be a unity. There had to be a national policy. Uh, extremely literate, depthful, philosophical, religious. His daddy had been a free Methodist minister. Uh, I discovered him. I was the guy in this National Wildlife Federation calling one Saturday. Uh, he, in one phone conversation, put his arms around me and gathered me up as a permanent friend and ally, made me a part of his board, his governing council. <clears throat> and I quickly became an advocate of what he first put on paper, a national wilderness preservation system with a policy that said forever to be preserved. This was Zonheiser. We would put this into the jurisdictions that would be within the Park Service, the Forest Service had broken new ground, and the Fish and Wildlife Service. Later we added the Bureau of Land Management jurisdiction. <clears throat> he recognized that unless we had a policy, a federal Congress defined policy to preserve, we were going to lose it by little pieces here or there of battle of attrition. And this was cold turkey, the organization. Six or seven people on the day when everybody got to work, the Wilderness Society. The term wilderness was not in common use. Don Iser saw the idea, he saw the concept, he wrote this in the Wilderness Bill. Well, immediately, the commodity people recognized this as a horrible red flag. The idea that you were gonna lock up forever portions of the wild country in these federal jurisdictions and make them off limits for development. The loggers, the miners, the oil companies, everybody, the grazers that weren't were beyond, all came in on full attack. And it took eight long years to get this bill through that says we're going to have a policy, we're going to put wildlands from these three jurisdictions into it, we're going to save them for the American people for their wildness. 
it was a call to arms for all of the commodity interests. Did they marshal their powerful lobbyists as this bill was introduced in 1956? Uh, several pages. Uh, here's how we're going to do it. They came in with their super rich lawyers, their teams. They were going to make duck soup out of this whole idea. Sonheiser had witnessed a great fight over dams, and in that fight, uh, a rich man had come in with unlimited funds, said, I'm going to get you a media firm out of New York City, and I'm going to have you use this guy to stop this dam inside of Dinosaur National Monument. Sonheiser got the benefit of that education. It was a three-year fight, joined with a guy named Dave Brower, a few of you will remember. Old timer, now gone. They got together on the wilderness bill and uh, saw what they could do. Sonheiser wrote it, gave it to a strong Republican in the House, Pennsylvania, didn't know much about wilderness, but he believed in it. John Saylor and Hubert Humphrey, a great wild-eyed liberal from Minnesota, they said, let's go with it. So they introduced it. Sennheiser had learned so much about people like you, kind of open-minded, well-intentioned, loving in a lot of ways, generous in many ways. People like you that just want to make the world a better place. He knew those people were there. He put the bill in about this size uh, with explanatory what it would do and sent it to 600,000 people. He got the two members of Congress to send it in envelopes with their name on the envelope so the postage was free. He found benefactors to kick in the money, and all of a sudden, people that didn't know wilderness from the wild bull in the pasture had this package with the bill, the explanatory comments, and here's what you ought to do if you're going to guess. Well, this didn't deter the opponents. They just threw the book at it. So it went into hearings, and the hearings produced the Bible. What did Zahnheiser do? He scrapped around, got the money to print uh, 60,000, sent those free. Mailing after mailing on the Frank envelope, I think it would have been recognized today as a great illegality. I don't really know <laughs> how he pulled it off. But folks like us, all of a sudden, had the wilderness bill is one of the big priorities in our lives as far as the country. This occurred at a time when people were becoming aware that Congress set the policy for our public resources, the forests, the grazing land, the water, and so forth. So it did ride that weight of environmental awakening. Uh, hearing 17. Uh, the chairman of the uh, Senate committee, progressive people, both Republicans and Democrats, got it through the Senate twice, but there was an old horn toad from uh, Colorado, Wayne Aspinall. He was from the West Slope. They grazed, they logged, they irrigated, they mined, and they, uh, and they dug for oil. They were never going to have a wilderness bill. He was Horatio at the gate. No, never. Until John Kennedy came in and one of John Kennedy's people happened to be a wilderness guy. And he kept talking to the president. And finally the president called Mr. Aspen and all and said, Wayne, I want a wilderness bill. you got to get me that wilderness bill. Well, nobody tells the president no. 
he did, Aspinall had his whole card. He wasn't done. Instead of putting all of the refuges, all of the wild parklands, and all of the national forest primitive and wilderness areas in, Wayne said, no, only the nine million acres of national forest will go in wilderness and wild areas that they had, the rest, up to 50, 60 million had to come in with separate acts of Congress. That meant that any time a national park or a primitive area were proposed, you had to write a bill, present it to Congress, get House and Senate sponsors, have it go through House hearings, advanced up, passed by the House, same with the Senate, finally signed by President. Uh, a merciless, tiring, exhausting job. Zonheiser passed. The bill passed when he knew it was finally going to come out of this old bird, going to come out of the House Committee. We were going to have it signed by the President. It was September 3rd, 1964. Grand celebration by all of us. You, we got the wilderness bill. Little did we know, I knew, I, that we had to go through this laborious process to round it out, to get the park, wildlife, and remaining natural forest areas. And at that point, John Eicher left, and uh, I was left as a young guy that he had brought onto his staff, had been with him for 10 years, eight on his staff. And uh, as the guy said, there I was. I uh, didn't know quite what the hell to do. I got in the airplane in Great Falls, Frontier at that time, stopped at every town with a pocket full of membership cards. I'd call ahead to Idaho Falls saying, I'm coming to town. I work for the Wilderness Society. Once in a while, a member would recognize me. I want to tell you about the Wilderness Bill. Oh, yeah, we just got it. OK. And then I would lay it on. You know, we got it. It's a wonderful policy. But all of this damnable work has to be done. And that was where I got my education from people just like you who said, well, we'll do it. We'll form circles. There are six wild areas we know about and a few we don't know about. We'll organize with wilderness teams in the wilderness communities. We'll organize at state level people. And that determined the life of me. Uh, at that time, we had a magnificently big staff of six people, if you counted a couple of the secretaries twice and it forced us to go to the grassroots. And it was then when uh, I made the grand discovery of the good hearts and souls and the dedication of people here gathered. It was dimensional for me. I learned that democracy will work if good circles are put together, saying, what are we going to do? The sky's the limit. I don't care how much politics is owned, when you get the white heat of good people advocating for public cause, there's nothing stopping them. And that's what you are. And that's why it's so much fun to be with you, to see that we carry on with this tradition. Well, we went across the country, state by state, even the states without wilderness, you had to have their votes and garners. So you built circles, and they built teams. And wilderness became a fighting word supreme. The extractive industries came in, and they sent the $500,000 lobbyists. They were after you. We had the people, and they couldn't contend with that. Our people reached into their communities, they wrote the letters, they poured the hot oil down the backs of their senators and House members when they found them resistant. 
get work. And through that process of going to the state, we built one fine machine, a machine that worked remarkably as we went through that environmental decade, uh, the 60s, uh, magnificently, our environmental laws, 50s, late 60s, and 60s, they took the lead. Well, I, my heart, uh, I'm convinced that what we did on wilderness played off beautifully though for those great causes. That's the story of the wilderness law. Uh, we see it today. Now, the fun in that, of course, is the inspiration you get out of seeing folks like us make good things happen. The realization that democracy will work, and if we have good agencies and good people in the agencies, and the agencies were falling back now, they're not leading the way we want them. They have sort of eclipsed. So we got to pump them up. We've got wilderness people in the Park Service, the Forest Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service. There are some fine people, but they've got to be re-energized and encouraged and told to get on with the job. We have millions, tens of millions of acres of unprotected land that are yet to be put into the wilderness system. The law said, to the agencies, you'll do it in 10 years. Forest Service did it pretty well with the ones on its list. We've got a lot of forest areas that should be put in additionally. Park Service is way behind. Fish and Wildlife Service is a, we got some magnificent million acre, multi-million acre refuges, uh, BLM lands, they must be given the protection that only you can give. Defining areas, studying them to be sure they're wild, and then advancing bills through your congressman. And that's the job. We're about 60% done. We've got all of that ahead of us. In the meantime, uh, the incentive is some what so, languishing. Uh, we don't have the national organizations that we have, <clears throat> the Wilderness Society, which I work for, following a long line of old, dedicated seniors, men and women, has faded. We've the state <coughs> groups have faded. We don't have a strong, dedicated firing up of people all over the country from the national level. We don't have that within our federal wilderness agencies. So it's up to us, it's up to you to bring that home. And uh, we have a congressional delegation and the candidates, most of them don't know the word much less any idea of fulfilling with the wild, unprotected country that we need to have placed in the wilderness system. So the task is before us, and I don't know any prescription beyond the one I've made reference to. Going to local groups, building teams, having a state group, bringing back a state group that will fight for wilderness. There's this idea, you know, we'll sort of get along with Congress. We'll find common ground. The boys and girls that are making use of the public land for purposes of making money, they're not gonna change. They're gonna continue to wanna extract everything they get from the land that belongs to the people. It's for us to give the hard backbone to the agencies to tell the Congress we gotta have strong wilderness agencies and we want leadership. So what would I tell you to do? Get a hold of those birds that are running for Congress 
Ask them what's in their heart. Have them come to your meeting in your living room or at a restaurant. But meet with them. Say, what's in your heart? You're going to fight for wilderness? You know what the legacy of wilderness is in the country? You know how important it is to the every person that knows it? And if they are negative, give them the college sports. You know, BS, we know what that is. MS, more of the same. And PhD, piled higher and deeper. <laughs> Let them have it. Talk turkey to your members of Congress and get your good people in the agencies in there are many whose hearts are great. They got into work for the public because they love the public trust. Fire them up. That's the task. And then of course be good to the people that will come into your living room, come into the circle of a group. Don't worry about whether they're birders or alpinists or sportsmen. You know, we have a grand conglomeration of folks that will come to a party if you have a cause that's bigger than ourselves. This cause is bigger than we individually. It's a great cause for the American people. You all have served it. You all will continue to serve it. But don't let Montana language, as it now seems to, the Wilderness Association as we've known it is dimming out. We need to give it the strength and the conviction to fight. The people that don't want wilderness have decided they'll infiltrate our old line groups and they've had fun doing it. And some people say, well, let's get, get along. Uh, you don't just get along. You act with confidence, knowing what you're talking to, building on the people of substance within the agency, within your own circle, and you fight hard. Well, that's my mission in life. I'm terribly concerned about the waning of advocacy in the environmental movement and most social change movements today. It's up to us to make our democracy work for the people and for these resources we value. So I appreciate so much you're giving your time, your energies to this cause. And there's nothing like this circle, as big and wonderful as it is, I leave you with the charge, let's get organized, let's do it. And I thank you for the privilege of being here today.